wonderful to be with all of you, as well as uh, humbling. Thank you, um, Dan, for a wonderful presentation, which says a lot of things that I want to say. I'm not going to have time to say, so I'm really glad that you went first. Um, if, if Dan has been typecast as what, the person who talks about gay things, um, I'm in a no-break contract on this thing, it seems. <laughs> and part of that is simply my background as an Anglican priest who has worked elsewhere in the world, in Africa and so on, and been involved in global Anglicanism. And if you know anything about that, you know that global Anglicanism has been riven by a conflict singularly about homosexuality, and same-sex uh, behavior and the way the church should deal with it. And as a result, as a conservative, uh, traditional uh, Christian, Anglican, I've sort of gotten involved in on that and just been, this is what I end up talking a lot about. Um, now, my goal uh, this afternoon is not to examine homosexuality in particular uh, or the Bible and what it may say about homosexuality. I'm going to make a few um, assumptions before we move on. Um, and they're ones generally upheld by other scholars, so I'm not going out on a limb, I don't think. So the first assumption I'm going to make is that uh, I will define homosexuality as a psychophysical attraction of a person to another person of, of their own sex. Now, the origins of that desire um, are unknown and certainly disputed. So I, I can't answer your question that you asked about inclination orientation. But um, they're there. Um, and for the most part, such desires are not chosen by those uh, who identify themselves as homosexual. Um, they're not chosen, but they can certainly be encouraged. And furthermore, they can be enhanced. And that's been shown very clearly by practice, by pornography, and so on and so forth. So although the desires are not chosen, acts based upon such desires usually are. And furthermore, those acts have an influence on the desires themselves. So I'm not going to talk about that, but that's something to bear in mind. Um, second, I am assuming that the scriptures condemn homosexual acts. Uh, there are those who dispute that, but by and large, those uh, claims are not upheld by most, I think, serious uh, biblical scholars. My goal, as I said this afternoon, is not to explore either of these realities, homosexuality or scripture's teaching on. My goal, rather, is to reflect on what scripture-following Christians are called to do in the face of a culture whose sexual condemnations have now turned against the church. What do we do in the fact that it's the church now that is the problem vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the culture's view about sexuality? So I'm going to be talking about non-individualistic perspectives on this, not about this person or that person in a pastoral way. So uh, let's begin. You see this, uh, the, 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 the slide here. Anyone who knows the Irish singer Hosier's song and music video, Take Me to Church, will realize that the traditional view of Christian sexuality and homosexuality more particularly is pretty much irrelevant to the general youth culture of North America and Europe. This song, who knows it? A lot, yeah, okay. More than I ever did, obviously, before I was introduced to it. It's platinum award winning four times over, teen enveloping, having won Grammy Awards for teen music and so on. Um, uh, the song and the video angrily depicts the church as a violently oppressive opponent of true love, and in this case, particularly of same-sex love. True love versus the Christian church. The song asks people to take your pick. And it's obvious what young people are going to choose. And this vision has been widely disseminated, disseminated, propagandized, and embraced. It's not going away. Its deeply rooted personal and social vision is now bound to things that can't be argued away either. If you look at this sort of thing, this is 1914, so just two years ago, 87% uh, of Canadian young people, 18 to 29, believe that homosexual acts, acts are, 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 are to be affirmed, if that's what people want to do. That's virtually 90%, and I'm sure it's growing. Uh, you can't argue this away. 
What it has to do with is feelings and hopes and personal yearnings that are no longer about logic, but about what it means to be a human being at all. Not that the two things aren't related at some point, but it's the whole thing about being a human being from head to toe, heart to fingertip, mind to flesh. That's what we're talking about here. I'm going to claim it's also one reason why it's so important and not something simply to be put to the side because it's too divisive. So in the few minutes that follow, I want to suggest, by the way, in case you're interested, you can't probably see that, you can see huge differences in the rest of the world, right? Uh, uh, this is young people and their view, positive views about homosexuality. You can see why there's a global split uh, culturally all around the world and in churches in particular. And it goes right down to young people and the change of their views and how this has happened and so on and what it all means. So in, in the next minutes that follow, I want to suggest where the Christian entry point might be into this vast area of sensibility around sex, personal and social. It's not so much how to enter uh, or the equipment Christians should bring as they enter into this discussion, um, just the entry point itself. What is the entry point? That entry point, I want to insist, is our personal mortality and how that mortality, ours, yours and mine, relates to other people. And by mortality, I don't just mean our deaths, but the way that our death boundedness, that we are bound to death, and that everything about death shapes who we are in many respects, informs the shape of our life limitedness in terms of human generation, which is where sexuality comes uh, to find its, its, its purpose and its foundations. So that conjunction of mortality and generation, generation in terms of new children, new people, and so on, that conjunction of mortality and generation is what defines human sexuality, utterly and immovably, so I believe, in the sense that we are creatures of God. Those things go together. Contemporary redefinitions of sexuality and their deforming of the embodied self's purpose are, as I said, uh, not really the result of faulty logics, although faulty logics derive from that. Rather, this whole redefinition and shift in the way young people especially now think of their sexuality derives from a vast and profound reordering of social experience away from the immediate exposure of their selves to human mortality and towards an experientially buffered self defined by present choices of action. Now, I don't know whether you can see this, but the whole point here, one little simple picture, graph, is the unprecedented expansion of the average human lifespan in the last hundred years, only, just the last hundred years, the approximate doubling of the human lifespan from average, from 40 years to 80 years. That's for Canada alone, but it goes for much of the Western world and now other parts of the world in just the past 50 or 30 years, depending on where we're talking about. That was centered around, I, I, I hope you're looking at this very carefully. This is, this is what human life could be expected to have in years. Just 100, 200 years ago, what it is now. That's vis-a-vis -vis the whole of human history. One of the points to be made is that the lifespan and the recognition of that for Jesus was average. We think that he died as a young man. No, he didn't. He died as a good adult. Maybe a little earlier than some, but the lifespan, the average adult in Palestine is reckoned to be about the same as it was in England in 1700 and beyond. Anyway, how did this happen in 100 years? Uh, the, the reasons are pretty, pretty simple, uh, although they, 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 their common effect is, is debated and so on. It was centered around infant and uh, maternal mortality mostly, so that children stopped dying all the time when they were born, and mothers who had children, so that was just washing hands initially, but then you had antibiotics and you had other things, and suddenly everything changes along with a bunch of other things that go with it. Um, uh, and affected all kinds of, this single shift is known by epidemiologists as the great health transition. 
And it altered the way that people understood their lives in respect to human generation. That is to say, what it meant to have children, what it meant to raise children, what it meant to lose children. We were talking about what happened just the last week. I'll come back to the fact that it actually hasn't changed that much, but it has in certain key ways. Um, what it meant not to have children and to be single. Um, and so on. Uh, hope for the future. Uh, how, our, how we live from the past and towards the future and so on and so forth. Being cared for by the young as you get older. And finally, uh, ordering the moral shape of our brief lives with generational goods in mind. Um, I, I don't think, we don't think about this. We should think about it. This sort of picture of Elijah and the widow's son is from the late 19th century. Uh, here's the elderly Elijah, here's the widow, here's her son who's been dead that he's picked up out from uh, funerary wrappings and made alive. These sorts of pictures, extraordinarily popular. Why? Because they spoke to what people actually lived all the time. It was only around 1900 that this huge shift took place. We forget about that. Um, so, um, one could say so much here about the complex consequences of this great health transition. I'll just uh, list them here very quickly, some of them. Um, but it uh, covers almost everything about social life with respect to what uh, sexuality in engages. Constricted fertility. People have much, many, many fewer children. Later marriages. The average age of marriage in Canada has moved from about 22 in just 50 years to, I don't know what it is, 32, something like that, 33, which represents a huge shift uh, uh, demographically. Generational relations, where people don't live with their parents and parents don't live with their adult children, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, change gender roles in terms of work as women get married later and they do the same things as men and so on. The character of work as an individual decision of personal fulfillment and so on. The question, what does my body who does my body belong to, has now become, you see, singularly detached from anything but the self. It doesn't belong to anybody but me. It doesn't belong to my ancestors. It doesn't belong to my heritage. It doesn't belong to my children. It belongs only to me. That is one of the huge shifts in terms of understanding what a human being is, and it's only in the last 50 years that it's become ensconced in the West and begun elsewhere. Um, so uh, I have to decide what to do with my body. I mean, look at these sorts of things. This is, by the way, Jewish. This is a late 19th century American Jewish car. You had all these things for different religions and cultures of what the lifespan was like. This is what you were supposed to be when you were you were you started as children. You 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 you're raised by a, a mother. You grow. You go through a bar mitzvah, right? A passage. I'll come to that. You get married. You have children. Your your children and old people are together. I mean, there are different ways of, of framing this culturally in different cultures, but for all of human history, some version of this in every culture was the norm. I've got to stress that because we tend to think it was all relative. You know, you have people in South Africa and somebody in Polynesia, and it's all different, everything's different. No, it was all the same, more or less, until about 100 years ago. So sociology can explain this shift. Sociology can explain some of this shift. But neither it nor natural science has anything to say about the immovable shape of human life that remains in place despite these changes. Because after all, whether we live 40 years or 80 years, we remain profoundly limited beings just as we were 100, 1,000 years ago. And we are beings whose intrinsic purpose has no meaning when viewed solely within the limits of a set of disengaged embodied choices. Human mortality has been culturally obscured. I want to stress this point. But it has not been mitigated. It hasn't been changed at all. Uh, just the opposite. Our deaths now strike us as nothing but wrecking balls, extinguishing our hopes out of the blue. One of my favorite uh, changes in the, is what the word tragedy has meant. 
Tragedy used to mean, out of its original Greek thing, something that was meant to happen. Now a tragedy is something that is meaningless, that happens out of the blue for no reason at all. And that's exactly how the shift of our understanding of our lives is reflected. Apologetically, then, I concur with the great 17th century mathematician and theologian Pascal, whose pensées remain, in my mind, the only truly modern apologetic of lasting worth. Pascal's pensées, which were left unfinished at his own early death at age 39, something to remember, were in fact designed to be an apology for the Christian faith aimed at doubters, the dissipated, the tired and self-indulgent, and, and, and the despairing intellectuals of his circle. His fundamental argumentative principle is straightforward. That is to say, it's based on our contingency as entities in the context of the infinite and overwhelming. Who we are in the face of death, uh, of infinite space, uh, and so on and so forth. It's also based on the fact that we are something. How do we put these two things together? For Pascal, we cannot explain everything, let alone the most important things of our existences, because we are intrinsically subject to things that are completely outside of ourselves. Yet, we are subject, however fragile and small we are, as thinking, hoping, and loving beings. And it's on the threshold, you see, of this realization of our limited contingency and the fact that there's something outside of us that comes to us and ultimately has made us. It's on this threshold that the truth opens up, as he saw. And from a purely hum human perspective, God's life looms up as the all, if you will, that we can never, never become ourselves but know must be there for us. So the first thing we discover apologetically, which everybody can discover and eventually does, is that we are creatures. We are limited creatures of God. Now I stress this point because only if we can see that we are creatures in all the kind of breathtaking and fearful opening to our mortality to sexuality make any sense beyond immediate individual gratifications. And once that point is grasped somehow, or at least enter into, only then does the scriptural truth and wisdom of human life sexually ordered begin to make any sense. This is not the place to explain that truthful wisdom, but to define it just a little bit. Sexuality from the perspective of scripture's truthful wisdom, as I would define it, is the temporal mode by which human beings order their mortality through relations of generative responsibility aimed at God's receipt of our limited uh, beings. That's rather abstract, but you can see how it works out. Sexuality is about our movement, if you will, from atom to atom. That is to say, from the atom who is our mortal origin to Adam as the son of God who has taken that to himself. It's interesting, people did in the Middle Ages, talk about the death of Adam. It's not in the Bible, but it's obvious it happened. Here he is surrounded, famous painting, by his own children. Adam had children who cared for him as he grew old and were there to bury him. And this famous painting by Hans Baldwin Green shows the fact that the original Adam is actually taken to where he is meant to be only in Christ, who is the second Adam. People thought about human life in these terms, and, and I, I think it's important that we, we learn how to do it again in some fashion. And sexuality is about being born from two parents, a mother and a father. It is about growth. It's about familial demands and obligations, struggle and gift. It's about suffering. It's about sacrifice. It's about maybe not having children. It's about maybe being single, even though you don't want to be. It's about mortality in the end. I like to say that sexuality understood in a Christian manner is about thus three things. It's about the lifespan and genealogy, secondly, and what I call probation, thirdly. It's about lifespan in the sense that we live only a few years, which is not very long whether we're in the health transition or not, just a few years. And we come into being from nothing, and we end in the same intrinsic nothingness, but and through the grace of God. 
So that's first of all. Sexuality is about the fact that we only live a few years and we come out of nothing and go to nothing except for God's grace that has brought us there and takes us perhaps somewhere else. Secondly, it's about genealogy because that coming to be and that passing away is given by God to us in the shape of generational giftedness. Parents, ancestors, siblings, children, descendants. That's just obvious. It's so obvious that we don't even think about it, but it is the foundation of what it means to be a human being. Thirdly, it's about probation, precisely because how we live our lives genealogically, uh, as ordered in our struggles and in our suffering and our love and our final endings, how we do that constitutes the shape of our creaturely character, which is the final vehicle of our life with God. Probation meaning testing. We live on this earth for another. That's part of the waiting part that I think you were just talking about. The shape of our waiting is our probation. And that shape is given how we fit into the genealogical truth of what it means to be a mortal creature. So when we ask, who am I as a sexual being, the answer is given in how we fit into this generational passage. Neither sociology nor natural science can offer any compelling alternative to such an answer. How do we fit into this? They have nothing to say about that. Indeed, neither has any answer uh, uh, at all apart from uh, that which we offer in the Christian faith. In fact, the scriptural vision here is proven a deeply compelling fit to human experience in every universally charged age of history except our own, and our own if we think about it. So same-sex engagements, finally getting to this, we know have also been practiced in the same temporal and geographical extent. All of human history there have been people who have been same-sex attracted. We don't know this for a fact, but there are lots of reasons why we should think so uh, historically. That's not new. See, nothing has changed. We're still mortal. There are still people who are same-sex attracted within the character of this genealogical life that we live. Nothing has changed. The question is, what does it mean? And that's been what's shifted. Scripturally, same-sex behavior found its fit in the past, before our modern age, within the genealogical and probative ordering of the creaturely lifespan. Homosexuality was never an identity. It was never defined in terms of intrinsic desires until recently. And these desires, in any case, were not viewed as definitive of what a human person was. And probably, though we can't know for sure, most homoerotically charged individual, whatever that means, they found their places, often uneasy ones, morally and personally, uh, for many, they found their places within the genealogically ordered frame of male-female marriage and child reading. Here are two very famous people, one I like, Jean-Baptiste Lully, a great French composer, Francis Bacon, famous philosopher, both pretty well known to have been homosexuals who were married, had kids, Lully had ten of them, uh, lived their lives, uh, did things. They, we wouldn't have known about the fact that they were probably homosexual had they been living uh, uh, sort of straight and narrow, as we might want to say. But nonetheless, they found their place within this, this order fairly straightforwardly. There was a fit because most Christians more or less knew that their bodies were but for a day and were given for the service of generational existence and all its challenge. Furthermore, there was also at this time in the church a whole realm of life for single people, celibate existence in monasteries and convents and, and without them as well that were allowed and permitted and affirmed in some fashion or another. And as we just heard, a lot of that's been wiped away in our culture as a possibility. Uh, let me just say then, finally, what should the church be doing about some of this? I think the Christian church, Christian church's pastoral witness, therefore, uh, is about living in an embodied fashion what human beings have always lived but to do so in a way that actually can be seen and touched and be a part of. It's not about making arguments, first of all. It's about continuing to live. And one of the things I want to stress to end is that many of our churches have failed to do that. We've actually imbibed aspects of a culture in which uh, intrinsic desire sexually is simply something we choose and engage and, and, and provide meaning for individually. 
So what are some of the things? I think very, very quickly, just to run through to end, I think churches should acknowledge and focus upon issues of mortality. I think that's actually more fundamental than talking about how best to order our sexual lives according to certain rules, first of all. We don't. <laughs> we, we, we live in a culture in which death is not something we want to talk about, even in churches that are orthodox and traditional. We need to teach about the shortness of our lives, what that means. The whole art of dying. When, when was the last time anybody heard a sermon about how to die well? Uh, people used to read books about this all the way through the 19th century. Um, funerary discipline, uh, you know, oh, the craziness of what we do around people dying. Churches do celebrations of life and this, that, and the other. Uh, and they don't even take place in churches anymore, uh, and so on. Uh, encouragement of home hospice care. Uh, by the way, I should say, this whole issue of assisted uh, physicians assisted suicide and so on and so on, this is all tied to the same thing. This is why questions of sexuality and questions of, how, of what death is all about are actually linked in our culture. They're not two separate strands. They're fundamentally linked. Um, yeah, sorry, just more little pictures here. Generational connections. This is really important. Households that are multi-generational are good and they're virtuous in the best sense. But you see, our churches don't even do that. We believe the kids over here and the youth over here and old people over here and so on. The, the generational segregation of North American Christianity is fundamentally offensive to the stretch of genealogical lifespan probative existence that I've been talking about. It really is. Uh, now, it's understandable why we do this. It's a mistake. It's a profound mistake. Because what it means is none of us understand what it means to be bound together generationally, which is precisely how our mortality is properly expressed sexually. Um, Geneological formation, uh, aiming at younger persons and older persons doing things together. Rites of passage. I showed you that little thing of Jewish uh, lifespan. We don't have these anymore. They've all disappeared. We make them up. We try to make them up. But it's, if, if you go to, go to other places around the world still, although it's disappearing, you see one of the most important things is that at a certain age, young people are taken away with older adults, and they are taught what it means to become an adult sexually and morally. It doesn't happen anymore. You know, I, I, and it still happens. I was, I was in Tanzania just a couple of years ago, and the Lutheran bishop was telling about when he grew up, off they went for six weeks, with, with uh, six weeks, with a bunch of older men, and they learned things he had no idea about. And whether this or that individual was ready for it, they were shaped. And together they understood what it meant to become an adult. Um, and then the craft of suffering, finally, which I think goes back to this thing about waiting, the theology of waiting. We have, to, we have to be willing as Christians to help people learn how to bear pain. Because bearing pain, uh, for the sake of understanding our faith and seeing who we are and, and relying on God's grace and all that, that's all about coming out of our sexual existences understood in this deeper way. So, uh, you know, th this sort of verse is the kind of one that people wrote uh, little pictures about and so on. That's where you save your souls in suffering. Patience, same word. So, uh, you see, it goes to the gospel because when, when Paul says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And so on, he's talking about seeing God's grace from the standpoint of who we are as creatures. And I think one of the whole explosions uh, that have splattered uh, the reality of our sexual existence is all over the place in this world is we have lost who we are as mortal creatures. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's not integrated into the way we are to live and to teach our children and work with older and younger people together. So this is where I would end. I said it's a, it's a, big, it's a big question. Uh, and, and it's not about some of these personal questions of how do I work a, a, a pastorally with individuals who are struggling, which, which is absolutely vital. But I also think the church can't let go of this larger reorientation of its vision back to a teaching of creaturely existence uh, as, it's, as it's properly and immovably, as I said, made by God. Thank you. <laughs>